All right, good morning to my friends joining us via recording. Today is April 10th. We are wrapping up our week here together. So um, we're definitely going to do some lab review, maybe some lecture review as well. Um, so we're just going to go ahead and dive in. The one thing we've decided so far we want to talk about are the muscles that we find on the upper extremity. So we're going to do some work on our pictures here, see what we can see, see what we can't see, and, and we'll kind of go from there. So um, let me start. I'll give us a little bit of context or a little bit of terminology that we, we haven't really talked about too much related to the upper extremity. When we talk about the upper extremity, normal people call the upper extremity the arm, right? Um, but in anatomy, okay, we can do the wrist bones too, yep. Um, in anatomy, when we talk about the upper extremity, the, the entirety of it has actually two parts. We have the arm part, which is the upper part, of, of the upper extremity, and then we also have the forearm. Uh, so this is the lower part, if you will, the lower part of the arm. When I talk about the upper part of the arm, what bone lives in the upper part of your arm, or we call it the proximal part of your arm? What's the bone that lives up there? Yeah, that's where the humerus lives, absolutely. So the arm is where I find the humerus. So the forearm would be where I find what? There's actually two bones there. What are the two bones that live in the forearm? Radius is one of them. Yep, radius is there, and so is that ulna. Exactly, the radius and the ulna. So this week when we're learning about our movements, the movements that you're working on learning are actually movements of the forearm, things that move the radius and the ulna. Next week's uh, lab packet and lab activity is going to talk about movements of the humerus. The muscles that help to move the humerus actually live mostly on the back. Um, so it's going to be some of those big ones that you've heard of before, like trapezius, um, the lats, latissimus dorsi, um, the deltoid muscle that we can see today. That actually moves the humerus as well. But all of our movements that, that we're learning this week either have to do with moving the radius and the ulna that live down here in the forearm or have to do with moving the hand down here at the wrist. So just a quick note for us that there are two parts to the upper extremity. That's why we didn't just say the arm because um, that's technically just that higher part. Okay, so um, when we're trying to label things, uh, it, it is a little bit weird in some of our pictures. This is when I really wish that we had time to, um, and had all of us had muscle men at home, uh, because the challenge with taking pictures to help us see some of these muscles here is it's hard to get exactly the best angle. So I've got my friend, let's find him. He's around here somewhere, yep. Here's my friend, uh, the muscle man here. Uh, the challenge with muscle man, and, and what I might encourage you guys to think about doing is, I know it looks really silly, but the way that he's standing might be something you would try to do to mimic, to get an understanding of what the pictures show. So it was really funny, actually. The other day, my daughter was looking at him and she said, but why is he standing like this? And then she like did her body like this. It was super cute. Um, I couldn't really explain why because there's no good explanation for it. But I say that um, to say that we're used to looking at things and labeling things and your pictures. Um, show us things in anatomical position. And muscle man is definitely not in anatomical position. In anatomical position, remember that the palms are facing forward. So a you might want to make for yourself is that this part right here, this is the anterior forearm right here, the anterior side. That's why we have this picture, to show us some of this forearm stuff right here. If we were in, in anatomical position, this would be the posterior side on the back side of the arm. So um, the reason we took the pictures the way that we did was to show you mainly the forearm muscles. I know that makes it harder for some of the other big muscles that we're learning this week, which is why we'll probably bounce over to Google Images to help us out with some of those. Um, but keep in mind, this is the posterior forearm right here. And this is the anterior forearm when we're looking at things. When we're looking at our muscles, 
there's two really big ones in the forearm that we definitely want to make sure that we can identify. So let's start with those ones. The first one that we want to make sure that we can identify, and we talked about this one yesterday, is, is this big muscle right here. It starts right here, and notice that its tendon goes all the way down into the palm of the hand. Does anyone remember from yesterday the name of this muscle here that goes all the way down into the palm of the hand? Yes, that's the one called palmaris. That's why I keep using that, that palm word. So uh, this muscle right here that I'm going to draw a line off of, this one that you see its tendon going all the way into the palm of the hand is called palmaris longus. Palmaris longus. I cannot spell this morning. Sorry, guys. This is always going to be your reference point when we're looking at things in the anterior forearm. It's always looking for this big, long tendon that goes into the palm of the hand. This muscle right here is palmaris longus. We always want to make sure we can identify that one. When we go to the posterior side, when we're looking at the posterior side on the arm here, notice this muscle right here has little tendons that branch into each of the fingers or each of the digits, if we wanted to use a technical term. What might be the name of this muscle right here that branches into the digits of the hand? We look at our list there. Which one might go into the digits? Yeah, so, so Pilar noticed for us, yep, Exter digitorum right here, extensor digitorum. That one goes into the digits. So this big one here that I swing into the fingers is extensor digitorum, extensor digitorum. We always want to make sure we can find that one, the big one that goes into the digits, because it'll be our reference point. Same thing like we saw down here with palmaris. We're looking for the one that goes all the way into the palm of the hand, again, as our reference point to let us know where the other muscles are. Some of the other muscles that we're identifying are, some are easier, some are harder for us to identify. So let's start with some of the ones that maybe are a little bit easier to identify. I think that we can all probably get this one right here the one that I just drew uh, a line to. What's the name of the big muscle in the shoulder? Shaped like a triangle. This is one that's named based on its shape. Yep, this one is my deltoid muscle, so I'll just draw a line there. This big one here in the shoulder is the deltoid muscle. This is, in, in the way that I took my pictures, this is the best view of the deltoid muscle. You will see next week in your lab packet that we also ask you to identify the deltoid muscle again because you can see it from the back view, you can see front view, the deltoid muscle is visible in a lot of different places. So remember way back from our, our muscle naming packet, we talked about how the deltoid muscle is shaped like a triangle and that's why I call it deltoid because the Greek letter um, D is a delta, it's a triangle. So that's how we named that one. It lives on top of the shoulder. We're not movements on the deltoid this week because the deltoid moves the humerus. Today we're focusing on the radius and the ulna. So deltoid muscle there in the top. When we're talking about the muscles in your arm, so the muscles that live on the humerus, what's the name of the one that lives on the, the top of your humerus? When I have my arm like this, who lives up here on the top? or on the front side. It's the one that I use to do a curl here. Yeah, so uh, Gloria chimed in for me. We're, we're getting some more answers here. The one that lives on, on the top or on the anterior side, that's the biceps brachii. It is easiest for us to see biceps brachii actually on my other picture. See this little arrow that I just drew right here? This muscle right here is biceps brachii, lives on the front side of the humerus. So here's where it is on this picture, on the front side. When I want to find it on my other version of the picture, I can also see it right here on the front side of the humerus. So let me draw a line for that one too. It lives on the front side. I'll take my line all the way up there. Biceps brachii on the front side. When we talk 
talked about muscles. We said, remember, that muscles come in antagonistic pairs. Let's put that word down there. Antagonists. That means that they do opposite jobs of each other. Opposite jobs. So the muscle that does the opposite job of biceps brachii, what's the name of the muscle that does the opposite job? Does anyone remember from way back before spring break? Yes, lots of us are chiming in. Triceps does the opposite job of biceps. And if I do the opposite job of a muscle, I live on the opposite side of the body. So back here, my muscle on the back side of the arm, this is triceps brachii back here. So let me draw my little line. Triceps brachii on the back side of the arm. When I'm trying to find it on my other version of the picture, this big muscle I see back here, that's triceps brachii on the back side. So the big one on the back, triceps brachii. The big one on the front, biceps brachii. When we go over to this picture, again, the big one on the front is biceps brachii. The big one on the back is triceps brachii. So we've labeled five. Of our muscles these are our five big primary ones that we want to make sure we can always find in the arm so the part on the humerus the ones we're looking for we're looking for the deltoid at the top the biceps in the front biceps in the back same thing over here I can just see biceps in the front and triceps in the back remember in the forearm that we're always looking for either palmaris longus if I'm down here going into the palm or we're looking for extensor digitorum if I'm on the back side and I go into the digits. So those are our five that, that are easiest to identify. We were talking about this yesterday, so um, you can make a note for yourself here. We kind of decided, um, and I've passed this feedback on, that brachioradialis we really can't see it very well. So um, kind of cross this one off, brachioradialis. It's, it's not going to be, we're not going to be able to label it on our picture here. Give me a minute. I'm going to pull up in Google Images because we looked this up yesterday. Brachioradialis. Let me find a good picture. Okay, this one's pretty good. I'm going to share my screen with you here to show you. right here brachioradialis brachioradialis is found on the front side of the forearm so here's where I would have seen biceps up here triceps back behind it brachioradialis matches its name says brachioradialis this brachio part means it attaches in the arm region that means it attaches up here on the humerus Radialis means it goes all the way down. It actually attaches at the end of the radius. So the brachioradialis muscle with, with the direction that we have our, our hands arranged, the way that that muscle man is standing, it's really hard to see brachioradialis. So you really label that one. The big thing we want to know about it, because you actually do an origin insertion activity with it, we want to know that it lives on the front side of the arm. So it attaches up here on the humerus, like we see, and it attaches down here on the radius, like we see down here. Let me bump back because I got a note. Do we still need to know where it is? Like I said, Eileen, know that it's on the front. Um, I will check and see what other views we have of um, the muscle man in, in other lab packets. And I'll let you know if there's, there's another lab packet that we can see it better on. If there's a better view for it, then yes, I would say know it. Um, you don't need to know it on the pictures that we just looked at. Um, let's see some of those other ones that we need to identify. Uh, here's a first uh, a quick general question here. Uh, let's see how big this one is. Okay. Um, these are all small. Bear with me. This is what happens when I... Oh, here, I like this one. Well, that's really small. I was going to say, see how you can notice here's biceps and then brachioradialis down below it. But I know it's super tiny. So that's a really small picture. Not very helpful. 
Google Images is sometimes helpful and sometimes not. Let's see if I can make this one bigger. Oops. Went into another screen, but it is bigger. So let me switch screens. Yeah, so Pilar is mentioning it's anterior, which means that it helps with flexion. Absolutely. Let me get my new screen here. Okay, check one out. I like this one a lot. So I hid it from you. I hid the note from you. Um, we are looking at, on this picture, I can see brachioradialis here. I can see palmaris longus. And I can see a couple of muscles that are called the flexor muscles. Brachioradialis and palmaris longus, along with my flexor muscles, is this on the front side or the back side of the arm? The picture I'm looking at here. I've got flexors, I've got palmaris, I've got brachioradialis. Yes, uh, we're all chiming in. We're on the front side or we're on the anterior side. During office hours yesterday, we talked about how muscles that live on the front side of the forearm are the muscles that help me to flex the hand. So anytime you see this flexor word here, flexor means we're on the anterior side or we're on the front. So the big muscle uh, that, that's coming down from the side over here, that's brachioradialis. That's hard to see on our models, but I got a really big muscle here. The one that we found before, remember palmaris longus, how it's got this tendon that goes all the way down into the palm. The reason I told you guys to learn palmaris longus is because it's my reference point for where the flexors live. So see how I've got flexor, carpi, radialis, and flexor, carpi, ulnaris. These are gonna be examples of muscles here where their name, again, tells me where I find them. So radialis means that I'm on the radius side. Ulnaris means I'm on the ulna side. So here's that palmaris muscle in the middle. Notice how next to it, so lateral to it, closer to the thumb, is flexor carpi radialis. So if, I, if I'm toward the lateral side, if I'm closer to the thumb, that's flexor carpi radialis. If I'm next to it, but I'm on the pinky side, that's flexor carpi ulnaris. So let me go back to... I'm going to pull up our picture again. All of our labels, unfortunately, our other labels will be gone. So you'll have to go back to, to the video if there's other labels. This will give us practice, though, because we're, we want to start with identifying. We want to start with identifying the big one. Who's this big one right here again? What's that big one in the middle that we said was our reference point? Who do we always look around? Exactly. That is palmaris there in the middle. Okay. So I've got this one right here that's on the pinky side. And this one right here that's on the thumb side. Let me give them numbers. Here's number one. Here's number two. Number one or number two? Which one is flexor carpi radialis? Who lives on the radius side? Can we tell? Yes. Yeah. So muscle number two that we have right there, that's on the thumb side or the radius side. That makes this muscle that I find closer to the thumb next to palmaris longus, that's flexor carpi radialis. Ah, I lose of radial pulse. Yeah, I like that. So it's on the radius side, the radial pulse. That's where we would take it over kind of on the thumb side. Absolutely. Okay, so this one over here is flexor carpi radialis, which means the one on the other side next to palmaris longus is the one that's on the pinky side. Pinky's all curled up right here. This one is flexor carpi ulnaris. Flexor carpi ulnaris. Yeah, exactly. So here, we'll put, we'll put a little number here for palmaris, too, just for consistency. Palmaris, muscle number three. Okay, so let's add a couple more lines here. Here's one line, because we labeled these before. Two lines. 
We're going to call this one back here number four and this one number five. What's the name of muscle number four? Muscle number four that I just labeled. Who's number four? Yeah, here's number four back here, right? Number four is on the back side. So that's going to be my triceps muscle on the back side. Number four, which makes this one here on the front side of the arm, the biceps up there. Exactly. Okay, so we found all of those muscles on the anterior side of the arm or the forearm, excuse me. Remember, always want to make sure we can find palmaris, the one that goes into the palm of the hand. And then we've got our, our ulnaris and our radialis on either side of it. And again, remember, if you live on the front side of the forearm, you are always a flexor. So if I forget almost everything and I, I'm blanking on the exam, if I'm looking at a picture of something that's on the front side of the body, its name starts with flexor. And if I know that it's not palmaris longus, because that one's very obvious, I look at it and say, okay, are you on the pinky side or are you on the thumb side? Based on that, I can get the last word in its name. So know that the flexors live on the front, know whether or not we're on the ulna side or the radius side, and that'll help you figure out their names. Okay, when we look at the back side, so let me go back to sharing that picture with you there. Bear with me. I'm gonna go back to here. Now that we're here on the back side, remember the muscle that I told you to reference was extensor digitorum. Extensor digitorum is the one that goes down into the digits in the hand, extensor digitorum. So we always find that one first. Once we found extensor digitorum that goes down into the digits, now we need to find extensor carpi ulnaris and we need to find extensor carpi radialis. Extensor carpi ulnaris is on the ulna side of extensor digitorum. Extensor carpi radialis is a little bit harder to see, but it is on the radius side. It's kind of wrapping around here on the radius side. So again, the reason I told you guys start with extensor digitorum is because that's always my reference point. On the pinky side, we have extensor carpi ulnaris going down by the ulna. On the radius side, we have extensor carpi radialis. So let's go back to sure. So much bouncing. Let's see. Pull this one back up for us. We lost our labeling from before, but let's go ahead and orient ourselves. Right here, this is the one that goes all the way down into the digits. I can see it branching into the digits there. This one is extensor digitorum down into the digits. I can't really see super well the one that would live on this side over here. If I could see the one that lived on this side over here, is this one gonna be ulnaris or is this gonna be radialis that would be on that side? I got one vote, what do we think? There we go, a couple of votes here. This side over here is the pinky side of the arm, so yes, it would be where I'd find ulnaris. So it's kind of hard to see. Um, probably it got kind of cropped out. Let me zoom in, see if, it's, if there's any remnants of it left. Maybe just a tiny bit left, so I zoomed in here. Right along the very edge, so the big one, is extensor digitorum. Next to that would be my, ex, I'm gonna abbreviate here, extensor carpi ulnaris. Extensor carpi ulnaris on the ulna side over, over here. So this little muscle that I kind of see here, extensor carpi ulnaris. Actually from this angle, we can see extensor carpi radialis really well. This muscle that starts up here and extends down into the radius side, 
This one right here is extensor carpi radialis because again, it's on the thumb side or it's on the radius side of the arm. So we'll give that a little label too. Extensor carpi rad. It's my rad one, the cool one over there. Extensor carpi radialis, extensor digitorum, extensor carpi ulnaris. So the big trick with, with the muscles in the forearm, whether we're on the back side like we see here, or whether we're on the front side like we saw over here, both of those, uh, it does technically have longest, you're correct. Um, we, we should add the word longest there just to be, to be technically correct. It, it, the reason it has longest, PLR asked why uh, there's extensor carpi radialis longest, uh, is because there's also extensor carpi radialis brevis. One of them, uh, longest, goes all the way down to the, oh, let me get my pointer back here. One of them goes all the way down the end of the radius. That's the longest one. And one of them stays up closer, up higher to the top, um, and is brevis. So remember back from our, our naming lab, right, where we said if you've got the word longest in it, that means that it's really long. The opposite of that would be brevis. So I do also have an extensor carpi radialis brevis. Um, we're not asking you to differentiate between the two of them. So extensor carpi radialis longus technically is its full name. But the good news is you don't have to write its whole name. So when you start to see extensor carpi radialis, yes, it's going to have longus after it, but radialis is the big word we care about here. Okay, so in summary, when we're talking about identifying muscles, there are the two muscles that are my reference point. Remember, my two reference point muscles, make sure we can find these guys, palmaris longus and extensor digitorum. Because if I can find those two muscles, I can predict whether we're talking about radialis or ulnaris. I can predict whether we're talking about radialis or ulnaris, because those two are on either side of it. What questions do we still have about labeling these muscles? And I promise you guys that on the homework assignment and especially on the exam, we're going to do everything we can to find you a good picture. So um, this picture would really just be best for extensor digitorum and extensor carpi radialis longus. I'm not going to use this picture for extensor carpi ulnaris. I don't like it. I'd have to find another one. Um, this one is great, actually, for both of those flexors on the two sides. So make sure we can find those flexors, because I can definitely see that. Um, carpi radialis, we want to know carpi radialis. Yeah, so that's, that's the, the big one that we can see up here, right? Extensor carpi radialis. When I'm talking about the flexor, uh, the flexor is, is over here on the front side. Okay, I did get um, a request that we talk about the carpal bones again. <coughs> Excuse me. That's a good tie-in to the fact that the name of, of these muscles, right, have, have carpi in them. So remember that carpi means the carpal bones. Um, the carpal bones, if you were to put it in easy words, where are the carpal bones found in your body in easy words? Where are those carpal bones? Yeah, those are the wrist bones. Absolutely. So um, let me find my page with the wrist bones here. Wrist bones are right here. For those of you with the lab packet open, help me out. Uh, which page has this picture of, of our bones? Page 10. Perfect. Okay. So we're on page 10 when we're talking about the carpal bones here. So um, we mentioned this yesterday. It's in your guided lesson. The best way to, to memorize where the bones live is to, to have a phrase. Um, so the phrase that we gave you guys this semester is Sally left the party to take Cindy home. Sally left the party 
to take Cindy home, the order of the first letter in each of, of these words here matches up with the order of the carpal bones as they're listed here in, in the packet. So this particular phrase, the, the way that it goes, it goes from the thumb side, thumb side over to the pinky side, and it goes from the proximal row into the distal row. So what does that look like on your picture? It looks like we start on the thumb side over here with our big bone right here, and we name them going next door neighbors, and then we go back over to this side, and we name those bones one at a time from the thumb side to the pinky side. First, we start in the proximal row, and we go into that distal row. So when we're trying to identify these bones, the first big one that I see in the proximal row, this big one here is called the scaphoid. That's for Sally, the scaphoid bone right here. Next door to that uh, is the lunate bone for left. This little part that you see right here, this is as much of the triquetrum as we can see. Uh, if you can't see anything, Eileen, then go ahead and refresh. Your screen must be angry at us. Uh, this little part that I see right here is the triquetrum. Remember what we did yesterday. So let's all go ahead and do this together again. Um, do me a favor and bend your wrist backwards, kind of like this, as far as you can comfortably do it. Bend your wrist backwards and feel on the pinky side, uh, uh, there's a bone that sticks out in your wrist. The little bone that sticks out in your wrist over there, that's the bone called the pisiform, or I like to remember it as the party bone, because, you know, that's my, my phrase there. The pisiform is the bone that you can feel sticking out. That bone is attached, or it's, it's uh, sticking out up here on top of the triquetrum. So um, the triquetrum, this one right here, and the pisiform, these are physically attached to each other. The triquetrum is the big one that's on the bottom. The pisiform is the one that sticks out. So you can feel your pisiform bone when you bend your hand backwards. The triquetrum is, is right there underneath it. So we've got the scaphoid, the lunate, the triquetrum, and then the little pisiform that sticks out right here. Now that I've named all four of those bones, I'm going back to the other side. Now we're starting our, our second part here. So our, our, fir our first two bones in the second part right here have very similar names. The first one is called trapezium, and the one right next to it is called the trapezoid. The way I remember who's who is they're in alphabetical order. So trapezium comes first then the trapezoid, trapezium, trapezoid. This big one right here is called the capitate for Cindy. And this last one over here by the pinky is called the hamate uh, for home. So we've got the scaphoid, the lunate, the little bit that I can see of the triquetrum, and then the pisiform. We bounce back to the trapezium, the trapezoid, the capitate, and the hamate. This is, you might want to make a note for yourself or underline highlight star, this is the anterior view. So when you're standing in anatomical position, this is when we're on the palm side. When we look at the posterior view, what it looks like on the back, here's how you'll know that you're looking at the posterior view. There will only be three bones along this proximal row right here. Because remember, the pisiform bone is, is attached to the triquetrum. So when I look at, at where that bone will be found, when I'm on the back side, I can't see the pisiform bone. So then it looks like there's just three bones in this proximal row here. We still have our scaphoid, the scaphoid, or a scaphoid. I don't know what I said. It was wrong before. Scaphoid right here, uh, lunate next door. Now I can see the triquetrum much better because there's not a pisiform on top of it, but I can't see the pisiform from this view. So if there's just three bones down here, we're on the backside, backside. scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum. Then we go back up here. The one that's right next to the, the thumb is the trapezium. Then we have the trapezoid, capitate, hamate. 
So use your phrase, or if you don't like this party phrase, because we're all missing having parties right now, right? If you don't like the party phrase, Google has a whole bunch of other ones that you can use too. We just want to make sure that we know the order that those carpal bones go in. So um, that's the names of those carpal bones for us. The only two things, literally, that you guys told me to talk about so far are those muscles and the carpals. So help me out. We still got some time here. Are there any other topics you would like us to discuss some more? Because we still got time. What are other things we're, we're feeling a little bit dicey on or things we'd like a little bit of review on here at the end of the week? Okay, yep. Yeah, uh, actually, Kelly, Lexi is the one who wanted to, to talk about that activity. So it's perfect. I'm glad that you reminded me, Lexi. Glad you made it to our office hours today here. So let's go to the last page in the lab packet. I will do one of the two origins and insertions because I'm going to ask you to uh, do the other one at home. So um, let's uh, put this to the class here. We can either work on palmaris longus. That's the first one on page 15. Or we can work on flexor carpi radialis. Which one would we like to do together? I'll just do one of those two on that page. Do we want the flexor or do we want palmaris? Okay, I got two votes for the flexor. Some of us are still finding the page. Um, well, unless I get an overwhelming surge here, we might stick with the flexor then. Yeah, so I got one vote for Palmaris. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do flexor. Maybe, Angelica, see when, when we're doing flexor, see if maybe that helps you out with working on, on Palmaris longus. Um, and, and we'll see maybe toward the end we can come back and revisit it just to make sure we have, have the resources we need to, to get that one finished. Okay, so remember how I always tell you to do these activities. If at all possible, you do want to try to color code. So we need three colors. We need blue for our origin. We need green for our insertion. And we want to go ahead and use red for our muscle. I recommend the order you go in is draw your origin first, then do your insertion, then connect the dots. So color in your muscle. So we're going to go through and use the information here in, in the packet to help us identify where, where these things would be found. So the first thing we're going to label is going to be our origins. And when you look at our list here, the origin is found on the medial epicondyle of the humerus. This medial word right here. What does medial mean? Medial. Yeah, medial, think of it as the middle. We're closer to the midline. So the medial epicondyle, this, this epicondyle word, by the way, remember um, from studying for the midterm that an epicondyle is, is a bump. So I'm looking at my humerus here. Here's my humerus up in the arm. I have bumps. The, the epicondyles are found at the distal end of the humerus. So I have a bump right here, and I have a bump right here. We're going to call this number one and number two. Number one or number two? Which of those is the medial one? Which one is closer to the midline medial? Yes, we're all voting number two. Okay, so. The first thing I'm going to do on my picture here to help me to figure out what's going on with this, this muscle right here, I'm going to put a blue dot for my origin on the medial epicondyle of the humerus. It's on the middle side of the humerus. I've drawn my origin. Now I'm going to draw my insertion. My insertion is in green. My insertion is down on the metacarpal bones. 
metacarpal bones. Let me give you three options here. Metacarpal bones. Are they in the fingers, the wrist, or the palm of the hand? I'll type those options for us. Are they in the fingers, the wrist, or the palm? Where do I find the metacarpals? Yeah, several of us are chiming in. The, the metacarpals are the big long ones that are in the palm of the hand. So these ones right here that are in the wrist, these are the carpal bones. These long ones that I see right here that are in the palm of your hand, those are the metacarpal bones. And remember that we have three phalanges out here on each of our fingers, uh, except for the thumb. The thumb only has two phalanges. Yeah, um, so Pilar is asking a good way to remember them. The way that I like to remember them is that the metacarpals, these bones right here, are the place where the phalanges meet with the carpal bones. So metacarpals, where the phalanges meet the carpals. Um, so question about numbering them. Uh, help me out, let me put this to the class. When I am numbering, which side do I start on for number one? Where's number one at? When we're, we're talking about, it's the it's same thing for phalanges and metacarpals, exactly. Um, the thumb is number one, or the lateral side, when we're in anatomical position, that's number one. So number one's always out here on the thumb, and we count over from that. Which actually is the same way when we were naming um, our carpals, we always started on the thumb side too. So remember with the hands that the thumbs are, are where it's at, right? That's what makes us human. We got our opposable thumbs. So metacarpal number one is this one out here in, in the thumb. Metacarpal number two is this one right here for pointer finger. Metacarpal number three here for the middle finger. Number four is there on the ring finger. And then number five is the pinky. So our insertion point is on metacarpals number two and three. So we're gonna color for ourselves a little green spot on number two and number three. Doesn't have to be pretty, it just has to be something you can see. Metacarpal number two and three. Oh, I like that, Leslie. Uh, think of number one as a thumbs up, you're number one. That, that's great, I love that. So number one is the one in the thumb, giving you a thumbs up, that's awesome. Okay, so I have drawn uh, my origin and my insertion, my blue and my green. So now I'm gonna do my connect the dots, right? This activity is a connect the dots. I don't know about you guys, but man, I'm doing a whole lot of, of art projects right now with my three-year-old. So this is this is my little mommy's art project right now. This is mommy's art. Um, yesterday she made us, look, my, my mom is here to help us with her and she made us little Easter cards where she traced her hand like this to make little bunnies. So we've all got little Easter cards that have bunnies. So <laughs> how do I find time for that? Um, I find time for that by not sleeping. That's the short answer. <laughs> Um, yeah, so <laughs> she made us little Easter cards, and then yesterday we, we did little little arts and crafts. So, all right, here is, um, here's our muscle. We've got our origin, and we've got our insertion. Remind me, when we talk about origins and insertions, um, which is the one that does move when the muscle contracts? Is it the origin or the insertion? that moves when the muscle contracts. Exactly, the insertion is gonna be the part that moves. Uh, and it's written all over these activities in your lab packet. Um, when we contract a muscle, the insertion always moves toward the origin. I said this in class, we say it in the guided lesson and I'm gonna say it again now. To help you predict actions, you really need to use your own body. Like, I can look at this picture, if I'm lucky, maybe I can predict the answer. What you've really got to do is now that we've labeled where these points are, you need to find them on yourself. So if you put your arm out, I know we're not together in class. If we were, I'd make you do it in person. So you put your arm out next to you, and this place you touch on your body is the general location 
of this medial epicondyle. So when your palms are facing forward, it's that part of the humerus you can feel that's toward the midline of the body. That's your origin up there. The insertion is down in the palm of your hand, uh, down there with number one and, or number two and three. So when you're in the palm of your hand, number two and three are generally in this area. Hey, we don't have to get the exact location right. We just need to have an idea of where it is. So it's right here. And my medial epicondyle for, for the frame of reference over here, I'm going to put my arm back in anatomical position. My medial epicondyle is right here. I know it's funky. So feel it on you. You've got your medial epicondyle, hopefully that you're feeling, and then you feel down on metacarpals one and two. When I bring my insertion point closer to my origin point up here, there, there are two ways that I can do that. The first way that I can do that is not necessarily the movement that's being described right here. The first way I can bring this origin or this insertion point closer to the origin, the first way I do that is when we go like this, Psh, right? Push off, too cool for this. That's the first movement I can do. Here's my, my insertion. When I move it toward my origin, I can move it straight toward my origin. When I did that, the angle between the palm of my hand and, and my radius here, the angle decreased. It got smaller. What's the first action? What would I call this in anatomy words when my angle gets smaller? What's the movement word for the angle gets smaller or the bones get closer together? Exactly. Yeah, a couple of us are turning in. The first thing that flexor carpi radialis does is flexion. That should be no surprise, right? Look at its name, flexor. The first way I can bring this insertion closer to this origin is by doing flexion, by pulling it straight up. But maybe I don't want to pull it straight up. Maybe instead of pulling it closer in, in this way, maybe I want to do it at an angle. So this is where, again, I really want and need you guys to feel this on yourself. My, in, my origin is over here toward the middle of your body. I've got an attachment site that's closer to the outside of the body. The other way I could bring this attachment site closer up here is I could just slide this site over here, and you can do this on your hand. I can slide this site this direction, right? Let me draw a little arrow for us. And you can do this with your hand. Please do do this with your hand. I can move my hand toward the midline of the body. Hey, when I talk about moving things toward or away from the midline of the body, we're talking about the movements abduction and adduction. When we talk about moving things toward and away. Yes, so we said that when I move this point right here, when I'm trying to get it closer to this point over here, because that's what happens when I do muscle movements, I move things closer together. When I move things closer together, either we can do flexion, which it na its name already told me for doing flexion, or I can scoot it over, which in this case is toward the midline of the body. And as Eileen mentioned for us, moving it toward the midline of the body, that's add adduction, adduction, moving it toward the midline of the body. And if you go back to your packet, when it talks about pre uh, predicting muscle movements based on their location, it said that muscles that live on the medial side help you with the process of adduction. This muscle lives on the medial side of the arm compared to flexor carpi ulnaris that lives a little bit more on the lateral side of the arm. That's why flexor carpi ulnaris would actually do abduction, pull that hand away from the middle. So our activity here asked us to predict the, the action of this muscle. When you get these kinds of questions on the exam, I'm not going to give you muscle names. I'm uh, either going to give you a picture that looks like this one, or um, I might 
tell you the names of some bone markings for you to feel on yourself to act it out. Either way, with, with these kinds of prediction questions, acting it out 100%. I promise you're allowed to stand up. Like I said, in, when we're taking the, gonna take the exam in class, do an interpretive dance, please do. Figure out what happens when you move that assertion closer to that origin. That's 100% allowed and that's the way to make these kinds of predictions. So um, use these activities to help you practice can I find this on myself? Then can I move the insertion closer to the origin? Yeah, Eileen likes the thought of an interpretive dance, right? That's what, what we're missing out on, right? We don't get to dance for each other during the lab final because we won't be together. Actually, nobody really dances. It's kind of sad. I wish there was more dancing. When I give the exam in real life, I wish there was more dancing because that would be way more fun for everybody. <laughs> Do I get any dancing emojis today? I know it's been, it's Friday, right? We are all tired. There's probably not a lot of dancing going on. Uh, the underlined word is confusing. The answer is to pull the hand away. Um, no, the answer is pull the hand toward the midline because my, my origin is at the midline. My insertion is farther away from the midline. So when I bring my insertion closer to my origin, that brings me toward the midline of the body. I'm doing adduction with this muscle. Yeah, so um, that, is, that is correct. I can only imagine what people would think walking by the classroom, right? Yeah, if everybody was in there dancing. I mean, hey, that'd be, that'd be a whole lot of fun, like if we made up a dance to, um, to memorize all of these things and I, I made you all do it together. You all would hate me if I left the door open if we were all dancing together. Yeah, that's okay, Pilar. We're all still waking up. It's, it's all good. <laughs> I know I had some friends that came in a little bit later. Um, we have only talked about lab stuff so far. If you have any lab type que questions, let me know. Um, so far today, we've talked about muscles, we've talked about the carpal bones, we've talked about origins and insertions. What other things would you guys like for me to cover with you in the time we have left today? What other things do we want to talk about? Well, we think I'll, I'll pull up my meme too. For our friends that came a little bit late, I was particularly proud of this one today. You have lecture questions? That's fine, Emery. Go ahead and uh, fill up the the chat box for me here. Uh, what some of those um, those topics are that you have questions about? Today is is open season, so we can we can do anything. We can talk about some lecture stuff too. I know, isn't it great? I did a search this morning for um, anatomy Easter puns. You might be weird if that's what your, your Google search history says, anatomy Easter puns. But hey, this one was, was, was pretty happy. The more I look at it, the more I like it. <laughs> On the sheep brain, Kelly asks, where is the epithalamus? Um, what we're going to label as the epithalamus is just the pineal gland. Um, so if we if we put them separately on the list, ignore epithalamus, uh, cross it out and replace it with pineal gland. So let me all pull that up really fast. The the main part of the epithalamus is the pineal gland. So let me get my my cross section right here. OK, um, so when we're labeling the pineal gland is this guy right here. <clears throat> that is the majority of the epithalamus. So ignore epithalamus. I'm not going to specifically ask you about that region because the biggest bit is the pineal gland. So those are somewhat interchangeable. And hey, who remembers? Um, was it just yesterday we did lab? Wow. Who remembers from lab yesterday what this big 
these big bumps right here represent. I'm being mean, man, making you type. Yeah, there we go. Just give me quad, the corpora quadrigemina. Yeah, those those big bumps right there, that's these guys, the corpora quadrigemina. Remember, these are, we talked about these yesterday, where I find visual and auditory reflexes. They're not nearly this big in humans, but remember we said that all sheep have to do is stay alive. So if they're going to stay alive, um, they just need to have really good auditory and visual reflexes. So really big bump here being corpora quadrigemina. A smaller bump up above it is the pineal gland, and that's the only epithalamus structure we need to know. <coughs> Ariel asked about the cerebral aqueduct. Um, the cerebral aqueduct is a structure that I use to move cerebrospinal fluid. So we're, we're going to work our way to where the cerebral aqueduct is. Um, it helps me to move cerebrospinal fluid. There are four fluid-filled chambers in the brain. You're studying them this week. Lateral ventricle, third ventricle, fourth ventricle. We use special tubes to connect the lateral ventricles to the third ventricle and the fourth, third ventricle to the fourth ventricle. When we talk about the cerebral aqueduct, that's one of my tubes. Where does the cerebral aqueduct, um, what does that connect? What ventricles does the cerebral aqueduct connect to each other? Is it the lateral to the third or the third to the fourth? Yeah, so multiple of us are chiming in, number three to number four. So the cerebral aqueduct, cerebral aqueduct, connects together the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle. Does anyone remember when we talk about the ventricles? The third ventricle is side of one part of the brain. Which part of the brain is the third ventricle found inside of? Does anyone remember? It's the part I like to call the duck face, if that helps us to figure out where it is. Ah, I got a, got a, got a little tricksy on us here. here here's my, where my third ventricle will be found. Uh, the, the hypothalamus is part of it. Um, actually, the third ventricle itself is mostly inside the thalamus. Um, yeah, so Kelly gave us the big picture word, the diencephalon. That includes the, the main region here, that's the thalamus. That includes the epithalamus, our little pineal gland. You were so close, I mean, yep. And then what we can't really see is the hypothalamus that extends below. Um, the third ventricle is inside here. It's the fluid-filled space in this area here. Fourth ventricle is found right in front of something. Um, any ideas what the third or the fourth ventricle is right in front of in the brain? Yeah, Leslie's mentioning the cerebellum. Yes. Okay. So see down here, I've got my cerebellum. The cerebellum, by the way, is beautiful. That probably when, whenever I do the sheep brain dissection with students, this is my favorite part of the brain to look at because just look at how pretty that is, right? So we've got these little white lines inside of here. These are called the arbor vitae, the tree of life. That's the white matter of the cerebellum. And then I have the gray matter here on the outside of the cerebellum. See this open space right here. This open space that I see right here is the fourth ventricle. So we are looking for uh, the connection between the open space right here and my fluid filled space that's hard to see, but would generally be found right about here. We're looking for the cerebral aqueduct. So the cerebral aqueduct is kind of this line, or it's, it's a space that I see right here. You might have to kind of draw it to help yourself identify it, but the cerebral aqueduct is the little tube that connects together the third ventricle that's inside the thalamus up here to the fourth ventricle that's down here in front of the cerebellum. So the cerebral aqueduct is the tube that goes down between them. Honestly, we can see it a lot better on the models and on the picture. So if I'm gonna ask you that on the exam, I probably won't ask you that on the sheep brain, 
but knowing where it is 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 a helpful thing uh, we got a question in the chat remind me help me out where is the third ventricle what's it what did we say it's found inside of third ventricle is inside the thalamus so um, this structure right here is the thalamus so when you're labeling your third ventricle it's just kind of generally this space right here put a circle around it it's found here in the thalamus in this general area and then I've got the cerebral aqueduct that connects the third down to the fourth. We can see the fourth really well right here, the open space in front of the, the cerebellum right there, fourth ventricle. Okay, let me scroll back up because I know I got a couple more questions. Excuse me. Okay, so Lexi asked about the channels on the ions. We can definitely talk about that. And um, Emery asked about blood vessels. So let's do a little bit of compare and contrast here. I'm going to start with the blood vessels question, and then we will do channels, Lexi. So I'll do channels next. We have two types of blood vessels in the brain. Blood vessels in the brain. When I talk about the type of blood vessels that are really leaky, What's the name of the leaky blood vessels in the brain? Who can help me out with that? Who leaks? Exactly. The, the leaky blood vessels of the brain are called the choroid plexus. These are my leaky blood vessels. So the other type of blood vessels, which is the main type of blood vessels in the brain, remember that we talked about these back in, in lesson one, right? These were the continuous, continuous capillaries. And continuous capillaries, they do or do not leak? Do continuous capillaries leak? Yeah, these ones are, are no leaking, no leaking allowed. Part of what helps the continuous capillaries not leak is that on the outside of them, um, or, or I guess kind of including them, we have this structure called the blood-brain barrier. Yeah, Eileen's absolutely right. The blood-brain barrier, which is essentially three layers of tissue that, that I have between the blood inside the blood vessels and the brain tissue. So uh, as we talked about in, in the guided lesson, those three layers that we have, layer number one is the cells of the blood vessel. So I'll give you the technical name of them because this will be an, a name P2 thing. Endothelial cells. Endothelial cells. That's the cells of the blood vessel. Cells of the blood vessel. Endothelial cells. They live inside the blood vessel. Cells are completely attached to each other. There is no space between them. So nothing is going to get out from these type of blood vessels. On the outside of those blood vessels, we also have connective tissue. Does this connective tissue have holes inside of it? When we're talking about the connective tissue around these capillaries, does it have holes? Eileen is saying no. Any other votes? The connective tissue around a continuous capillary? Yeah, the, the word continuous means that there's no spaces. So the connective tissue with no holes, no spaces in between it, um, maybe think of it kind of like saran wrap that wraps around the blood vessels. Those blood vessels already were connected to each other where there was no spaces in between. We said, though, that we had three layers, right? Three layers. So the first layer is inside the blood vessel itself. There's no space between those cells. Second layer, we've got connective tissue that wraps around. Again, no holes or no spaces in between. My last layer, my third layer, is actually a kind of cell that the brain tissue has. Does anyone remember the name of the type of cells that wrap around these blood vessels too? There's one last layer. These are special cells. Yeah, so Pilar actually got it for us here. Those astrocytes, astrocytes are the ones that I find around the continuous capillaries of the brain. Yeah, uh, we're, we need the ependymal cells too, actually, Kelly. That, that's coming up next. So astrocytes are the last kind of thing I have wrapping around the, oh, I know, it's hard to type, um, 
wrapping around the, the blood vessels. So when I talk about the continuous capillaries of the brain, this is the kind of blood vessels that are inside um, blood vessels that have the blood brain barrier um, protected. These are, these are the ones that keep your brain safe. We have three layers of cells or tissue that are keeping you safe. When I talk about these three layers uh, of cells or tissues that are keeping you safe, what I told you when you're trying to figure out the blood brain barrier stuff is think about these like three plasma membranes. Three plasma membranes. True or false? Plasma membranes let everything through them. True or false? Plasma membranes let anything pass through them. Yeah, got a lot of us typing in false. Absolutely. Remember the word we use for plasma membranes? They are selectively permeable. Selectively permeable. Not everything can get through. Things that can get through are things that match the middle of my plasma membrane. So what are some of those words that we used to describe the middle of my membrane? What's going on with those little tails that are inside of there? How did we describe those little tails? How do I feel about water? Let's start there. Yeah, how I feel about water is I am hydrophobic. I hate water. It's not happening. That's the first thing. The second thing was, was my synonym for how I feel about water, right? The, the synonym for how I feel about water is that I'm non-polar. We could add a new one to the list. The new one that we could add to the list that also means the same thing is lipid soluble. Lipid soluble. Lipid soluble means I dissolve in lipids. I dissolve in fat. Because the middle part of the membrane that decides what gets through is the part that has those lipid tails. So when I talk about the blood brain barrier, the only things that can get across the blood brain barrier are things that are hydrophobic, things that are nonpolar, or things that are lipid soluble. Yeah, so Eileen is mentioning oxygen. Uh, yep, uh, oxygen is something that actually is nonpolar. It's an example of a nonpolar thing. We can have lots of other nonpolar things as well, though. Um, so you have to be a hydrophobic molecule, you have to be a nonpolar molecule, or you have to be lipid soluble to be able to get across the blood brain barrier. When I talk about the choroid plexus, these blood vessels are leaky. Leaky as in they're constantly spitting out fluid. It's not like though they're just leaking because they're broken. When I spit out that fluid, the stuff that I'm leaking out, what am I making at the choroid plexus? What are they leaking out for me? Yeah, so a couple of us have chimed in. The reason I have choroid plexus, what they make for me, is I'll put the whole name for you, cerebrospinal fluid. I use the choroid plexus to make cerebrospinal fluid, to make CSF. So I need to have my, my leaky blood vessels that are leaking out fluid because that fluid makes cerebrospinal fluid. Um, Pilar asked if they're the only ones that make the fluid. That is correct. So choroid plexus, I find it in all four of my ventricles making cerebrospinal fluid in those places. Those are the only places in the body that make cerebrospinal fluid. The cerebrospinal fluid is, is plasma, or it's the fluid inside the blood vessels that comes out and is filtered by a particular type of cells. So Kelly here, I'm, I'm, I'm Brent, bouncing back to you here. You told me the name of the cells that help me to make my cerebrospinal fluid. That's the ependymal cells, that's right, okay. So ependymal cells come in over here. Ependymal cells surround choroid plexus. And their job is to make sure, since you're leaking fluid all the time, let's make sure that what we leak is only going to turn into cerebrospinal fluid and not going to have bacteria or viruses or bad stuff inside of it. But the thing with us leaking this fluid is because we're leaky, and because the ependymal cells are a little bit less picky than those astrocytes, we can leak out other stuff that the blood-brain barrier would say there's just no way. 
Remember, the only things the blood-brain barrier lets out are uh, things that are hydrophobic, things that are nonpolar, things that are lipid soluble. Anything else, if it's going to have the possibility of leaking, is going to have to leak out of these choroid plexuses because they have some spaces. Remember, they are leaky. Um, they have some spaces that allow other things to get out. So the choroid plexus is where I would see, I, I mentioned this in office hours either yesterday or a couple days back. If you get a brain infection, it probably, oops, can't spell, probably started here. These blood vessels are more leaky. If something like bacteria or virus is going to leak out of the blood vessels, it's probably going to leak in these places, as opposed to at a continuous capillary where there's not a lot of space. So um, the leaky blood vessels let more stuff out. They're still, it, it's not like there's no filtering going on because we have the ependymal cells. But the ependymal cells, uh, Emery's question was asking specifically about things that are nonpolar. Ependymal cells are, are going to let some nonpolar things get through. When we're talking about astrocytes, when we're talking about endothelial cells, we're talking about that extra connected tissue, these are not going to let nonpolar things get through. Or excuse me, polar. Ah, too tired. Let's just erase this all. We'll draw a little mess and then I'll draw you a penguin here in a minute. Okay, polar things. Emery asked about polar things. Polar things, ependymal cells are like, Sure, as long as you're not like dangerous to me, I'll let you through. Polar things can get through. What's my water word um, if if I'm polar? If I'm polar, I'm hydro, yep, hydrophilic. Uh, and if we're talking about water here, right, we might as well throw in water soluble. These kinds of things still, it, it's not that they're getting into the brain very much because they're not getting in very much. Um, but if they're getting in at all, they're getting in through the choroid plexus. So Emery's question asked about polar things in particular. Would I be able to get a polar thing out through the blood-brain barrier? Would the blood-brain barrier let polar things into the brain? It would not. Yeah, it would not. So in that in relation to that specific question, polar things when we're talking about diffusing into the brain tissue, the only place that's gonna happen is at the choroid plexus. Let me check up here and make sure. Uh, Pilar asked about the cilia. Um, big picture when we think about the cilia, the job of the cilia is to move the cerebrospinal fluid that they make. Um, so it's not that they really move stuff out as much as they just keep the fluid flowing. Because remember, we were making fluid all the time. We got to drain that fluid all the time. Primarily, that's what the cilia are for, to drain that fluid. And um, Eileen asked about if we only find choroid plexus in the brain. That is correct. Um, when we talk about leaky blood vessels in other parts of the body, uh, does anyone happen to remember from, from way back lesson one? Um, what's the name of the leaky blood vessels that we talked about in other parts? Of the body like the liver and the spleen does anyone remember their names those really leaky ones in the liver and the spleen it's been so long right i'll help us out the really leaky blood vessels that i find in most of of the body that's leaking those ones are called sinusoids sinusoids yeah let's listen it starts with an s yep absolutely sinusoids the leaky blood vessels in other places of the body um, one version of them is sinusoids. We also have some other ones um, that you'll talk about more in AMP2 called fenestrated capillaries. These ones don't leak as much, so little leakage. Uh, but these are the ones that I really use for the big thing we talked about was filtering. The choroid plexus is not about filtering per se, at least not in the same way that the sinusoids are. <laughs> Emery asked, glucose is likely to leave through the choroid. Um, we, we do take glucose across the blood-brain barrier. Let me pull up my, my picture here to show that. We do take glucose across the blood-brain barrier, but to get it across is, um, oh, that's the wrong one. 
To get it across, I can't just do diffusion because glucose is polar. If you notice on our picture of the blood-brain barrier, let me pull this up. Picture of the blood-brain barrier here. Some things go straight across the membrane, like carbon dioxide, like oxygen, uh, like my fat-soluble molecules that go straight across the membrane. I need to get some things across the membrane that, that are not those things. And this is what we talked about earlier in the week. We used the word transport. When I use this word transport, it means that I no longer did diffusion. As Eileen mentioned, I have to have a protein channel. So I do take glucose out of the blood and put it into the brain tissue across the blood-brain barrier, but I do not use diffusion. So diffusion is when it goes straight through the membrane. When I talk about transport, I had to use a protein, use a protein channel. So any of these molecules, like you see here, glucose that's polar, I had to use a protein to get that across. My amino acids, because they're a little bit bigger, I'm gonna have to use a protein to get them across. Hey, if something gets too big, there's not enough proteins in, in the blood-brain barrier to even get it inside. So um, some molecules just can't cross the blood-brain barrier. I died there for a minute, I think. Um, what I was saying here about my large molecules is if you're too big, you can't cross. So uh, when we're talking about what what leaves the blood vessels, Emery, so Emery's spe a specific question from the, the, the homework assignment. Um, when we're talking about allowing something to leave the, the blood vessel, what I'm saying is, is like basically just let it pass through the membrane, let it diffuse out uh, or let things go. So when we're talking about um, moving glucose across the membrane, the blood brain barrier can't do that without help. Um, so that would be something that I can just do with the choroid layer because I need to have help to get things that are polar across the blood brain barrier. All right. I had a question about the channels on a neuron. So we're going to teamwork this. Let me go to lesson number 10. We're going to pull up our favorite neuron picture here, and we'll work our way through it together as a class. When I talk about channels on the neuron, I need to think about the functions of those channels, or so many of them have this word gated in them. I need to consider if they are a gated channel, what opens the gate because that will give me a tip off as to where I might find these different things. So we have two kinds of gated channels that I find on different places of the neurons. We have the ones that are called chemically gated and the ones that are called voltage gated. Help me out with chemically gated channels. With chemically gated channels, what's the thing that opens that kind of channel? What opens up a chemically gated channel? I forgot to ask you, right? Gated means we're not always open. So, yeah, Leslie mentioned for us, chemically gated channels open with chemicals. There's a specific kind of chemicals that open up these channels on neurons. What's that specific chemical that opens channels on neurons? Exactly, my neurotransmitters. So when we're being specific, when we're, we're talking about neurons here, neurotransmitters are my chemicals that open up this kind of channel. When we talk about voltage-gated channels, what opens up voltage-gated channels? How do I get voltage-gated channels open? Yeah, no need for the question mark, Eileen. Voltage-gated channels do open up when I when I do something with the charge. Voltage-gated means they're they're charge sensitive, if you will. Change in charge opens these up. 
Now, the reason that we always outline this when, when we're talking about where I find these different kinds of channels is if we're talking about a chemically gated channel, we need a chemical, we need a neurotransmitter to open it up. When I talk about neurotransmitters, it's not everywhere on this neuron that receives neurotransmitters. There's really only one location on this neuron that receives neurotransmitters. What's the name of the part of a neuron that receives neurotransmitters? Or in other words, receives messages because neurotransmitters are those messages. Oh man, I hope more of us than just two know where we receive messages on a neuron. Okay, a few more of us are, are, are chiming in here. The part of my neuron that its job is to receive messages is at the dendrites. So the dendrites, think of them kind of like the, the receiver dish, if you have a satellite. Um, dendrites receive messages. So my dendrites are the little bounce, uh, the little parts that attach here on the outside, these little branching parts out here. All of these are dendrites. My dendrites are the places where this neuron receives messages. So my dendrites are going to be the only location on a neuron that I have any of my chemically gated channels. The kind of a, a big picture, underline highlight star idea, the only place on a neuron with chemically gated channels is the dendrites because that's the only place I get these chemicals, these neurotransmitters. So chemically gated channels found all over the dendrites. Some of those channels, when they open up, they let in chloride. Some of them let in sodium. Some of them spit out potassium. Um, but all of them open with different chemicals. That's what a chemically gated channel does. So I've got chemically gated channels all along my neuron here. Chemically gated channels help me to create what are called EPSPs and IPSPs. And we talked a lot about these in office hours last week. So I'm not going to go nuts and talk about these a ton, but here's what I'll say about, about these little things. These are little change, little changes in charge. When I talk about an EPSP, help me out, friends who've, who've been here, EPSP, that makes my charge positive or negative. An EPSP, what direction do we go with those? Yep, we go positive. EPSP is excitatory, which makes me more positive. IPSPs are still little changes in charge except these changes in charge make me more negative. If my neuron is going to fire, that's what it's technically called, or if it's going to talk to its neighbor, I need to hit a value called threshold. What's the number on threshold? Yeah, Eileen got a step ahead of me, which is perfect. Threshold value, negative 55 millivolts negative 55. That's what I've got to hit. Oops, negative 55. I've got to hit this charge to be able to send a message. What do I start at before I, before I receive a message when I'm at resting membrane potential? I start at what charge? Yep, negative 70. Okay, so if I get enough of these EPSPs, these excitatory messages, little positives, That'll get me all the way up to threshold where the charge on my membrane is negative 55. When I'm at negative 55, now my charge or my voltage is different enough to cause me to open up voltage gated channels. That's why I've got to get to threshold because once I get to threshold, voltage gated channels open. So, um, yeah, voltage gauge sodium in particular. That's right. So when we're trying to figure out where I start to have voltage gated channels, we're really looking for trying to figure out 
the, the first place that I'd see them would be the place on my neuron that does summation, where I add together messages. When I look at my neuron here, which part of this neuron actually does summation? Which part of a neuron does summation? What's that called? Yeah, we're, we're starting to chime in here. The part on my neuron where I add together all these little messages that my dendrites receive is the part right here called the axon hillock. This is where I add together my messages. So I add them all together here at the axon hillock. If all of those messages, when I add them together, gets me to threshold, I will open up my voltage-gated sodium channels. Voltage-gated sodium channels help my membrane charge to get really positive. But if I have voltage-gated sodium channels to get me really positive, I need a certain kind of voltage-gated channels to get me negative again. What's the kind of channels that get me negative again? Who brings me down on the graph? Yep, potassium. Okay, so here, excuse me, here at the beginning at the axon hillock, we have voltage gated sodium channels that help me to, what's called depolarize my membrane, pull it up. Then we also have voltage gated potassium channels that I use to bring it back down. Voltage gated sodium, voltage gated potassium, the, the two kinds of channels that I see here. Voltage gated sodium channels depolarize the membrane but as I depolarize the membrane right here my next part down here on the axon says oh we're freaking out I've reached threshold so this part of the axon will also depolarize it will also open up voltage gated sodium channels which will cause this part of the axon to open up its voltage gated sodium channels and this part and this part and we go all the way down to the very end of my neuron I have voltage gated sodium channels everywhere where I need to freak out my membrane charge, everywhere that I need to depolarize it. So they start in the axon hillock and they go all the way down to the very end. I also have voltage gated potassium channels everywhere that I have voltage gated sodium channels. Because if I'm gonna freak out my membrane charge really positive, I need to be able to get it back negative as well. So voltage gated sodium and potassium channels, they start at the axon hillock and go all the way down through that, all the way down to these parts down here at the end. What were the names that we used for these little parts here at the end of my neuron? What are these parts called here? Two names for them. It's a lot of typing. I know there are a lot of typing. Yep, so the name that I like in lecture form are axon terminal. The end of an axon, or the way that you see it here, we saw it in lab, and the way that we see it here um, labeled to keep it consistent with lab are the synaptic end bulbs or the synaptic knobs, whatever you, you want to call it. We're, we're primarily going to call them axon terminals, end of the line. At the end of the line, I also have an extra kind of channel down here. The extra kind of channel that I have down here in the axon terminals is the type of channel that's going to help me move an ion in so that I can spit out neurotransmitters. What kind of channel is down here to help me spit out those neurotransmitters? Yeah, the calcium ones. So voltage-gated calcium channels, the only place I find those are on the axon terminals at the very end of, of the neuron, the axon terminals. So that's the one place on your neuron that you'll have voltage-gated calcium channels. Voltage-gated calcium channels. So Lexi asked, voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels on the axon hillock, the axon, and the axon terminals. What do we think? Gonna put that to the class. Axon hillock, axon, and axon terminals. Is that this is where I find those voltage-gated sodium and potassium? Okay, so help me out if that's not correct, what what do we need to change? Okay, so we're we're debating a little bit. 
Okay, the question was basically, where do I find voltage-gated sodium channels and voltage-gated potassium channels? That was our question. Okay, so let's, let's clarify. The axon has voltage-gated sodium channels. I'll mention, too, the axon um, terminals also have voltage-gated sodium and potassium down here. I do summation right here where I'm adding together my messages. When I add together my messages, I'm not receiving any messages. I'm just adding together everything that everybody else heard. I don't have chemically gated channels here. I just have voltage gated channels here. So we start having voltage gated sodium channels and voltage gated potassium channels here at the axon hillock. We have them all through the axon to move my action potential. We have them all the way through my axon terminals because remember, to get the voltage-gated calcium channels open, I have to depolarize my membrane. So I, uh, to, to answer the question, Lexi, it caused a little more confusion than I thought it would here. The answer to your question is yes. We have them starting here in the axon hillock. We have them all through the axon. We have them all the way down to the axon terminal. That's all the places where I have voltage sodium channels. All right, we hit the channels, we hit the locations on the neuron. We got a little bit of time left. Good, I'm glad to hear it. it's good review for us here. What other things do we wanna cover in our little bit of time that, that we have left here? Okay, the two types of conduction. Yep, I can talk about that. That relates well to what we just talked about here. So let me find that slide here for us. Saltatory versus continuous conduction. Let's pull that up. Someone who has their packets out in front of them. Uh, what page is this picture on? I'm here maybe page 13. This is from lesson number 10. We're talking about neurons here. So... Uh, we might be on page 13. There are two types of conduction uh, or two ways that we um, can send messages down an axon. Whenever I use this conduction word, what I'm talking about is how I get a message from the axon hillock all the way down the axon to get it down here to the axon terminals to be able to talk. So some of the neurons in the body have no myelin, like I see up here. Some of the neurons in the body do have myelin, like I see right here. Uh, when I am talking about conduction, the two types, as we're in the question, we had saltatory conduction and we had continuous. Continuous, oops, conduction. Two types. For my friends who have uh, studied this or have been to office hours, which of these, is it saltatory conduction or continuous conduction that I do on a neuron that has no myelin? If I have no myelin sheath, how do I send a message across my membrane? Do I use saltatory or continuous if there's no myelin? Yeah, a couple of us are chiming in here. If there's no myelin along the axon of my neuron, I'm going to do what's called continuous conduction. So we could add our label, and I think it's, it's on your notes here. Continuous conduction. <clears throat> this is the way that I get a signal down the axon in a neuron that does not have myelin. The best way to remember that is in continuous conduction, I have to depolarize all parts of my membrane. I'm continuously depolarizing them. Compare that to what I see down here in a neuron that has a myelin sheath around it. With that myelin sheath, I get to do saltatory conduction. Saltatory conduction. What saltatory conduction means.
means, yeah, like Eileen said, is, is it jumps. Or I, I build a signal at one place. I depolarize one part of my membrane. But I'm lucky I don't have to depolarize this part right here because it's not in contact with the environment. The, the myelin is insulating it. It's a fatty layer on the outside that, that doesn't let anything out. So I don't have to depolarize it again until I get to my next myelin sheath gap. Or remember the word that we used in lab for it, we called it a node of Ranvier. That's a place where I don't have myelin. So I depolarize my membrane right here. I don't have to do it right here. I just have to do it again right here at the node of Ranvier. And then that message can travel a little bit of distance again. I don't have to do anything here. I do have to do it again here. But I only have to depolarize my membrane at the nodes of, of Ranvier, not at every single part of my membrane. So when we talk about the speed of how fast things go, if I'm continuously making a new signal, if I'm continuously depolarizing my membrane, that goes a lot slower than if I can just jump. If I can go from one spot and then move down into another spot and another one and not have to do it everywhere, that allows my message to go much more quickly. Yeah, so there's an analogy in, in the guided lesson for you thinking about doors. So imagine that we're back in, in the Science West building, right? Back where it all started for, for us together. Um, if you had to go through, for you to be able to walk down that hallway, if you had to open and close every single door um, as you walk down that hallway, yeah, back in the day, if I had to open and close every single door in that hallway, it would take me a long time to walk down that hallway. If I only had to open and close every three doors, I could move down that hallway a lot faster because I don't have to keep opening and closing the doors. So what I do on Underon that has myelin is saltatory conduction. The only places that I have to open voltage-gated sodium channels and then close them and then open voltage-gated potassium channels and close them, I only have to do it at these particular locations. That allows my message to go more quickly. That helps me to do what's called saltatory conduction. For my friend who asked about this, um, what other questions do you have about saltatory conduction versus continuous conduction? And what I will say too is I, I know we talked about this in office hours, so if you check out the little notes underneath it, um, underneath the recordings, I bet you could find one that mentions it too. Okay, well, we haven't had a spontaneous dance party yet in the class, or we haven't had a, a thumbs up party here. I need some emojis here. I'm going to draw you guys a penguin. I'll draw the penguin. You guys send me an emoji about how you're feeling right now. Let's see how my penguin does today. And then I know I had a question from uh, Free. We'll end with that last question. Draw a little penguin for us. It's always the feet that get me. My little penguin feet always have some trouble here. All right, we got some penguins. We got some dancing. Awesome. Okay, so here's your little daily penguin for you. Again, for any of my friends that are new to office hours, I like to draw what are called macaroni penguins. So these are little feathers that are coming off of the macaroni penguin head there. So that's my gift to you today is, is a little macaroni penguin here. Okay, well, the last question that we, we got that we'll cover here was a question that I saw from Emery. Um, he's asking about Botox. So I'm going to give us a blank whiteboard here. Last thing we'll talk about here, we'll talk about Botox, and we'll talk about sarin gas, sarin gas. Botox and sarin gas, both of these are the, um, the conditions that, or the disorders, I guess you could say, of the muscular system that I asked you guys to talk about. Um, there were two things, and, and Emery kind of hinted at these things in his question, the way he was asking about it. There were two things that can kind of go wrong in the process of muscle signaling. It can be a problem with ACH, or it can be a problem with ACHE. When I use this abbreviation ACH, 
I know I'm going to make you type a bunch here. Um, help me out. Can't do we remember what ACH stands for? I know it's really long. Yeah, a couple of our of our classmates here are, are helping me out. The abbreviation ACH stands for acetylcholine. Acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is the name of the particular neurotransmitter that neurons use to talk to each other. So acetylcholine, when we just talk about ACH, that's acetylcholine, that's the neurotransmitter. That's the message that a neuron would release to give to a muscle cell to tell the muscle cell to contract. We also have what we talked about in the muscle chapter, ACHE. I, uh, I won't make you type that one because that's even longer. Acetylcholine, yeah, I'm already typed before, so anyway, acetylcholine esterase. Acetylcholine esterase. Acetylcholine esterase is not a neurotransmitter. It is an enzyme. It is an enzyme. Remember way back from unit two that enzymes are, are proteins that have a particular job. What is the job of acetylcholine esterase? What is this protein or this enzyme's job? Yes, exactly. The job of acetylcholine esterase is it breaks things down. It breaks down in particular acetylcholine. When you finish a muscle contraction, we want to get rid of the message to contract because then it's easier for us to listen for another message to contract. So I use the enzyme acetylcholine esterase to break down acetylcholine. When I break down acetylcholine, that message to contract goes away and, and I don't need it anymore. So we talked about two disorders here. We talked about the disorder of Botox or what happens during Botox. And we talked about what happens with sarin gas. So let's help each other out here. Which of these things, Botox or sarin gas, which of these is a problem with acetylcholine esterase? Which of these is a problem with that enzyme? Do we remember? Eileen's voting sarin. Yeah, a couple of us are voting sarin gas. Sarin gas is a problem with the enzyme. Sarin gas is a problem with acetylcholine esterase. When I talk about being exposed to sarin gas, what sarin gas does is it deactivates acetylcholine esterase. If acetylcholine esterase is deactivated or if it, if it can't do its job, what ends up happening is I can't break down acetylcholine. If I can't break down acetylcholine, acetylcholine sticks around forever. And if, it, if it's constantly sticking around, remember, this was my neurotransmitter. This is my message that told me to contract. So sarin gas is an issue with acetylcholine esterase. My enzyme doesn't do its job anymore, which means that a message that was sent once to tell me to contract once keeps telling me to contract and to contract and to contract. I'll hear it forever because I'm not breaking down my original message to contract. So as Eileen said, Sarin gas basically leads to constant muscle contraction. That's, that's problematic. When I talk about Botox, um, help me out for my friends here in, in the class. What is happening um, in Botox? What's going on um, when a patient gets Botox injections? Okay, good. So, so we'll start with, with basic description here. The reason people get Botox is to um, make facial muscles not contract anymore. So we would say instead of, so I'll, I'll use our terminology from before. We said in sarin gas, we're doing continuous contraction. I like that description. When we have Botox injections, we're doing no contraction. No muscle contraction is occurring. And so um, Ariel chimed in for us saying that what's going on in Botox is I, I ultimately I have too little acetylcholine. I need acetylcholine to make muscle contraction happen. When I, when I have Botox, I'm having no muscle contraction. The reason that's happening is because I don't have enough acetylcholine. 
what makes me not have enough acetylcholine in Botox is I actually don't release any. Neurons release no acetylcholine. They don't release any. So if I'm releasing no acetylcholine, I definitely have too little to make muscles contract. There's no contraction with Botox. With sarin gas, uh, it, it ends up looking like I have too much acetylcholine. And it's not even necessarily that I released any extra acetylcholine. It's just that the acetylcholine I did release, um, I, I'm not breaking it down like I should be in my body. So when we were talking about Botox and sarin gas way back a couple of weeks ago, I told you big picture what we want to make sure we know. Is it a problem with too much or too little acetylcholine? That's the first big picture that we want to know. The second big picture, we want to know how it works. So is it an issue with shutting down the enzyme or is it an issue with not being able to release any acetylcholine? Those are the big differences that, that we want to make sure that we know. Seems like it's super bad for you. Yeah, it's not something that I would want to play around with because <laughs> it, it, it does seem like it would be a bad idea. Um, Leslie asked, does Botox go away at, uh, over time? Um, can your neurons release acetylcholine again after time? Um, the answer to that, Leslie, is yes. Um, Botox is not permanent um, because if you remember from when we looked at our pictures of how Botox works, it goes through and it chops up the proteins that I use to spit out my neurotransmitters. Um, over time, your neurons rebuild those proteins. Um, so if someone gets Botox injections, they have to do it. It's, it's something like every two to three months, usually. If they're, they're wanting to keep those kinds of effects, they have to keep going in and doing it again. Because yes, over time, we will overcome the, the effects of the botulinum toxin and, and keep releasing neurotransmitters again. So it's not permanent. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Eileen asked, so is this why people can't move their face for a while um, after injections? Yes. And if, if we inject it in the wrong place, it may not be until, you know, three months later that they can smile again. So hopefully the injections go in, into the right place. Otherwise, you've got some paralyzed muscles for a few months, and that's that's kind of sad. Although it's, it's really not the – I feel like Botox is less likely to go wrong than, um, than like, filler – so I, like I, I've told you guys multiple times, I worked for a dermatologist, and so you can have them inject actual like jelly stuff into your lips or have them inject it into your cheekbones. Um, I don't think we had a lot of problems with like with our patients with it going wrong, but you always see those horror stories, right, um, or those horror pictures in, in Google images of, of what it looks like when someone gets too much filler or it's in the wrong place. It's That's pretty interesting. So natural, just stay natural. Like... Natural is, is good enough, I promise, guys. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, we are about out of time. Um, let me give you guys a quick note, um, and this would be something to pass along to um, your neighbors in all of the group me classes for me. Um, on Monday, we are not going to have office hours. No office hours Monday. Um, this is because you guys are taking that exam here at the end of the week. Um, I'm going to get your lesson number 12 posted for you, um, by Sunday night. Uh, but what I want you to focus on, on Monday, the time that we would normally be meeting, I need you Monday to complete, uh, the last lab packet. I need you to go through and I need you to knock that thing out because here's a reminder for us, uh, two weeks from now, two weeks from now. Lab exam is done. Lab exam is done. So um, uh, Eileen asked what number it is. What are we on? Number 14. Uh, so it's the spinal cord. Yeah, so complete the last lab packet. It, it's spinal cord uh, and nerves and reflexes. And then it's um, also the back, muscles and bones of the back. So I need you guys to use Monday to work on that. Tuesday's office hours are going to be lab focused. Tuesday, lab 14, um, because I want to make sure as early as possible in the week, we are talking about our issues with lab 14, um, because by Friday, 
of next week, we're going to do a general lab review. General lab review. This is weeks eight all the way through week 14 which sounds more scary than it is. Cause remember there's like three weeks of spring break in there or something. So um, here's, here's our overview and I'll get a schedule posted for you. Um, it'll, it'll be later in, in the weekend, but we're not going to have office hours on Monday because I really need you guys to knock out that lab packet. I need us to come Tuesday prepared with any and all questions we have related to lab 14. So try to get that packet done try to do one, two, or however many attempts on that lab homework assignment, because I really want us to make the most of our Tuesday office hours about the lab stuff. And then Wednesday and Thursday, we will talk about lesson number 12, about the spinal cord, so it ties in perfectly. Um, and then on Friday, like I said, we're gonna use that as a general review. What questions you, do you guys have way back from our first muscle packet all the way through the stuff that we're, we're covering this next week. Yeah, so like Leslie chimed in for me, um, we are not doing special census. If you already printed that packet, I apologize. Um, with us having an extended spring break, we had to cut that material. So we're just gonna do special census in lecture. Uh, special census in lecture is, is what we're gonna be doing the week of the lab final exam. Uh, so, so help me out here in the chat. Can you send me your lecture day really fast? I want to make sure that I've got at least one person here from Monday, Wednesday, one person here from Tuesday, Thursday. I know I got some Friday friends. Do we have any Tuesday, Thursdays here today? Perfect. Okay. Um, so please do me a favor and communicate in the class group me for me that there will not be office hours on Monday. And I will also post that in the announcement. Um, I will also um, just make sure that that it's known we're not going to have office hours on Monday because I really do need you guys to, to knock out that lab stuff to get us ready for that lab exam. All right, I'm going to stop my recording for today and we'll stick around for any last minute questions. So goodbye to our friends here on the recording.